My name is Lynn Knapp. Um, Y'all have maybe seen me before. I help coordinate these Forest Steward and GSP partner workshops. Uh, we're really excited that you all could join us for this presentation on just language. We have fantastic presenters today who are going to facilitate a discussion around a shift in how we talk about the plants and animals in our parks and green spaces and sort of the impact we have um, on the public at, in those spaces. So just a couple of things before we get started, I wanted to go over our agenda. Um, so we'll start with the land acknowledgement and some speaker introductions, and then we're gonna move into our main presentation for the majority of our workshop today. Um, we'll have some time for Q&A, so you can go ahead and put questions in the chat. Um, we are going to, at five o'clock, we're gonna go into some facilitated breakout rooms, facilitated by both our speakers and the plant ecologists. And then we're gonna meet back up for about five minutes at the end to just do a quick, quick closing and wrap up. So a couple Zoom basics. Um, please stay muted during the presentation portion of the meeting. We'll ask you to unmute and turn on video if you're comfortable doing so during the breakout sessions. The presentation is being recorded, but the breakouts are not. And like I said, you can ask questions using that chat function at the bottom of your screen. So sometimes, you know, when we're really shifting our perspectives and talking about topics like we are today, that can feel a little uncomfortable. So I like to start our sessions with just a few community agreements to ensure we're really approaching today from a place of learning. So our community agreements are make sure to be present, call each other out as we call each other in, create space for multiple truths as you speak from your own experience and not assume what others' experience may be, Assume best intentions, but recognize that intent is different from impact. Share gratitude for feedback. Notice power dynamics and positionality. Expect imperfection and center learning and growth. And getting used to having uncomfortable conversations are all important for us to consider as we have uh, uh, conversations like we are today. So all of that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa, who's gonna do a land acknowledgement. Hey, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, again, I wanna echo what Lynn said and really share my appreciation for your time and your curiosity today. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to anchor us in the Seattle landscape and offer a land acknowledgement. Lynn, Clint, can you click through? So Green Seattle Partnership acknowledges that we occupy the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. This acknowledgement does not take the place of an authentic relationship with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land we stand on and resisting the erasure of indigenous people past, present, and future. Um, we probably have some folks today with us that are not coming from Seattle. So I'd like to offer the opportunity for folks to um, acknowledge uh, where they're coming from. And if folks are not familiar with um, kind of how to identify um, indigenous territories, I've included a link to a map in the chat. I've also linked to some of the information that's provided on the Green Seattle Partnership website uh, that looks at, uh, provides more details on the tribes of Washington state, um, details on how to do a land acknowledgement, and then also helps explain the importance of uh, acknowledgement for Green Seattle Partnership work and the stewardship that we do. So next up, I would like to introduce our speakers today. We have Celeste uh, Mari Williams and Lisa Fink with us today. Uh, Lisa is a poet and PhD candidate in environmental studies and English at the University of Oregon, where she is currently an Oregon Humanities Center dissertation fellow. She conducts interdis dis interdisciplinary research at the intersection of cultural and political ecology, American studies, and feminist science studies. Her research focuses on race, colonialism, and the environment. Celeste Mari Williams is a playwright, former TV animation professional, and current graduate student pursuing an MA in biology with a focus on conservation and community engagement. Her creative and academic work centers on interdisciplinary projects that intertwine the arts, 
science and social justice to foster trust, empathy, and emotional connection with human and wildlife communities. Thank you both for being with us today. I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, Jacob de Guzman, who is um, an out-of-class plant ecologist with the Green Saddle Partnership and Saddle Parks and Recreation is here with us today. He'll be helping um, with the breakout sessions. And then Michael Yadrek is also here today uh, working on uh, the breakout sessions and some of the facilitation. So thank you all for your time. And without further ado. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and start talking while Celeste shares her screen. First of all, we just wanted to thank everyone for being a part of this conversation with us, especially during a global pandemic, wildfire season, hurricane season, and so many other related challenges that we're all dealing with. Um, in addition to the biographical information that was shared, we also would like to briefly introduce ourselves further so that you know where we are coming from. And I will hand things over to Celeste to go first. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry, I'm, I am organizing my page a bit. Things move around when you share the screen. So I'm just giving one second. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Celeste and I'm currently a Master of Arts student with Miami University's Project Dragonfly program. I live in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. Um, and given my proximity to the Woodland Park Zoo, um, I wanted to do, um, I wanted to kind of borrow their land acknowledgement, which is, uh, we recognize that these are the lands of the tribal signatories of the Treaty of Point Elliot. Uh, we acknowledge their stewardship of this, we, we acknowledge their stewardship of this place continues to this day, and that is our responsibility to join them to restore the relationship with the living world around us. Um, and while Chief Seattle of the Duwamish tribe was the first to sign, there were over 82 different tribal leaders represented. Those rights were quickly violated by European American immigrants. Um, Treaty of Point Elliot promises have been continually broken to this day. Uh, throughout my studies, um, I've been troubled by the language describing invasive species but it seems to parallel racist and xenophobic rhetoric targeting immigrant communities, particularly people of color and other underrepresented communities who have been historically marginalized. As a mixed woman of color with Japanese and Jewish roots, this language has felt personal to me. Uh, for both sides of my heritage, demonizing rhetoric portrayed unwelcome humans as foreign, alien, impure invaders and carriers of pestilence and disease. Such language justified atrocities to human life. As someone still pretty new to conservation in a field and city with a white Euro-American majority, uh, the language of invasive species has made me wonder if I'm also viewed as an outsider, perhaps less welcome or understood because of my non-whiteness and foreign otherness. I have actually identified with Jenny Liu um, as she grappled with her identity in her article, Am I an Invasive Species? And I could drop, the, I will drop the link to that article later. And I will hand this off to Lisa. Thanks, Celeste. Uh, I am currently located in uh, the ceded Ojibwe territory. Uh, in what is now currently known as Northern Wisconsin. Um, I am a descendant of German and Scandinavian settlers and I grew up on ancestral Dakota territory um, in what is now considered central Minnesota. My parents were dairy farmers, uh, ran a small family dairy and uh, who in 1981 fought to keep their farmland from being taken by eminent domain for a landfill. And in the process, Kate started one of the earliest recycling programs in that area of Minnesota. I was trained in biology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and later as a naturalist at Wood Lake Nature Center in Richfield, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. These days, I work with my family in Portland, Oregon on urban backyard habitat restoration. And I also claim the title of environmental humanist. I bring the tools of the humanities 
to study environmental thought, politics, policies, and practices. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how the language we use tells a story, how it reveals the ways we think, how we understand the world and our place in it and our values. We're going to be talking about topics and events that will potentially trigger the intergenerational and more recent trauma that some of you live with. Um, so we ask that folks do whatever they need to do to best take care of themselves. With that, uh, I will hand things back over to Celeste. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I actually have a quick question. Can someone tell me how to move the, the little boxes on the side so I can see my slides? Yeah, are you, so right now we're just seeing full screen of your slide. And if okay. you have, uh, if you're trying, are you talking about the Zoom? The Zoom? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Zoom and I'm trying to, I, I'm having a hard time seeing my slides because I see um, the people on the side. So yeah, just... so if you go up, so on the right hand side, um, mm -hmm. where you can see everyone, you'll either have it locked in to the right hand side of your screen, in which case there should be on the upper bar, a little option to the left with like a, a little gray um, minimize option. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so I will do a, another bit, a bit of an introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Um, so there has been a prevalence of value-laden, demonizing, and militaristic language used by local conservation organizations and the media when describing non-native invasive species. Um, tried and true war metaphors when describing invasive species have historically perpetuated xenophobic and racist attitudes through the Eurocentric lens of early American colonists and conservationists. Words have power. They can create a narrative that fosters negative perceptions, stigma, and deep-seated prejudices against the foreign invader as a threat to health and the economy. We believe the broader social context of historical and, and systemic racism and negative perceptions of the other should be considered. We aim for language that is holistic, non-polarizing and culturally sensitive to people of color and all underrepresented and marginalized communities. So I am going to um, show an excerpt of a, a short play Zoom reading um, from last year called Invasion of the Chinese of the sorry Invasion of the Chinese Mitten Crabs. So bear with me while I play this. Invasion of the Chinese Mitten Crab by Celeste Mari Williams. We begin our story in the port of San Francisco Bay. A ship arrives, bringing an unwelcome newcomer from the Far East to the waters of America. Ominous music, sound ship horn, and ballast water discharge. Thousands of Chinese mitten crab larvae are released into the bay. These free-swimming planktonic larvae with their large cephalothorax, prominent eyes, fringed antennae, and mouth parts will soon begin their colonization. The International Union for Conservation of Nature has listed the Chinese mitten crab as one of the top 100 worst bioinvasive species. Tell us more about these invasive crabs from China. The Chinese mitten crab, or Ariotir sinensis, originated in Southeast Asia from the coastal rivers and estuaries of the Yellow Sea in China and Korea. Alien invaders from the Yellow Sea. Yellow peril with claws. Now, wait a minute. How did these alien crabs get here? They were most likely introduced through international shipping from ports in China. Hello. 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 Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. Hello. 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 In fact, the crab larvae in San Francisco originally came from ballast tanks in cargo ships from Germany. 
enemy stowaways from China via Germany? What kind of diseases are they bringing? The Chinese mitten crab is a known vector for the oriental lung fluke trematode parasite that causes paragonomyiasis, a condition similar to tuberculosis. A parasite. So these crab invaders are bringing oriental parasites into our country. The risk to America. That will be it for now. Um, I, will, I will drop a link later where you can see the whole play and also to the website. I will go a bit into um, the problem with common names and place of origin. So common and scientific names that include the country of origin can ignite xenophobia and prejudice if the species is perceived as causing ecological or economic harm. And while currently under review, the Entomological Society's list of common names recently included Asian, African, Japanese, Mexican, Oriental, and Gypsy, uh, which have had outdated, offensive, and problematic cultural meanings. Uh, when, when these names are paired with words such as foreign enemy threat, menace, peril, it not only demonizes the species itself, but it also creates a negative parallel with the associated human community. The focus of conservation communication should be on the species potential for harm against the environment and not on its place of origin, which can lead to polarization and culturally insensitive language. The language has many interpretations and word choices, and word choices should be thoughtfully considered, especially when communicating to the public and media. Words that personify invasive species as aggressive, evil, murderous enemies that kill and slaughter gives agency to these species and can justify military actions such as waging war, controlling and formulating defense strategies against them, as well as enforcing policy decisions. The media historically uses invasive insects as metaphors for unwelcome immigrants, as, as, was, uh, as was shown with Brexit propaganda. Militaristic metaphors for invasive species that condemn them as bad and native as good can, in, can inflate existing biases towards these species and stigmatize groups of people associated with the country, which can reinforce nationalism and xenophobia. English challenges the morals and ethics of invasive that become a, a polarized political tool that focuses on killing enemy invaders to protect, to protect native species and ignores human responsibility for their introduction in the first place. Well-intentioned conservation management programs who aim to restore healthy ecosystems continue to promote military-like missions to remove or eradicate animals and plants considered invasive. The power of words. The origin of COVID-19 from Wuhan, China has inflamed familiar rhetoric and anti-Asian behaviors. The fear-mongering language such as the China virus, Wuhan virus, and Kung flu continuously slung by the former president have incited xenophobic and racist hate crimes, slurs, and inflammatory insults towards anyone of Asian descent. People of all ages, including the elderly, have been spat upon, beaten, and even murdered. Asian businesses, such as restaurants and manicure parlors, have been boycotted, tagged, and targeted for violence. I have feared for my own safety, along with others I know of Asian heritage. So I, I will provide some historical context, specifically with Chinese and Japanese origins in America. What's in a name? First off, let's look at naming and conservation and how that can have a negative impact. From literature research, um, some authors contend that language of non-native invasive species can be insensitive and exclusionary to communities who have been historically marginalized and treated as foreign enemies. Common and scientific names that include the country of origin can ignite xenophobia and prejudice if the species is perceived as causing ecological or economic harm. For example, management programs with missions to remove or eradicate invasive animals and plants with the common name Asian, Chinese, or Japanese paired with enemy evil invader menace peril 
has negative implications for people of Asian descent, especially since they have been historically scapegoated as carriers of pestilence and disease. The demonizing language around Asian giant, quote, murder hornets has fueled the fire of negative perceptions of pathogens, wildlife, and humans associated with those of Asian descent during COVID-19. Anti-Chinese sentiment in America began with the first Chinese laborers arriving in the mid 19th century during the gold rush and imported as low paid laborers building the transcontinental railroad. Chinese people were often scapegoated during public health crises as carriers of infection. Chinese immigrants were often forced to work in subhuman conditions and blamed for multiple outbreaks of smallpox and bubonic plague. The economic recession post-Civil War created unemployment and more white job seekers who blamed the increasing population of Chinese workers willing to work for less money. Many white workers viewed the Chinese as undesirable aliens stealing their jobs and made them the scapegoat for their economic woes. Invasion rhetoric and fear-mongering words such as the Oriental invasion and menace were used by Congress and Supreme Court justices to justify the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Yellow Peril discourse began in the late 19th, 19th century in response to Chinese immigrants. People from China and other Eastern Asian countries were perceived as threats contaminating the purity of white Americans. Political cartoons and news media portrayed Chinese people as, quote, dangerous to the white, living in most unhealthy conditions with a standard of morality immeasurably below ours. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 suspended all Chinese immigrants for 10 years and barred Chinese in the United States from citizenship. This was the first federal immigration legislation that targeted a specific nationality. Throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, Chinese immigrants not only faced legal obstacles trying to live in the United States, they also dealt with discrimination and violence from mostly white US citizens. Local examples include uh, white mobs rampaging, rampaging Seattle's Chinatown in, 19, sorry, in 1885, and in 1886, white mobs burned Tacoma's Chinatown and forced its, its inhabitants into boxcars bound for Portland, Oregon. Immigrants from Japan faced similar prejudices. The Japanese beetle was used to demonize Japanese immigrants as public health threats, particularly with the rise of Japanese agriculturalists in America. My grandfather and great uncles were farmers in Woodinville, Washington. Yellow peril rhetoric fueled further anti-immigration laws. The 1924 Immigration Act banned immigration from all Asian countries. During World War II, anti-Japanese propaganda images dehumanized Japanese people as vermin, portraying them as rats and snakes with overly slanted eyes and buck teeth. Words such as dirty Japs and Jap snakes fueled negative perceptions that justified the Japanese American internment camps. In 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which forced Japanese which forced Americans of Japanese ancestry into concentration camps because of their perceived allegiance to the Japanese empire. This is part of my own history where my maternal grandmother's family, who had lived in Seattle since 1904, ended up at Minidoka in Idaho. And at the same time, many patriotic Japanese Americans, including my grandfather and great uncle, volunteered for active military service. And now I will hand this over to Lisa. Thank you, Celeste. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the language of invasion, particularly as regards the environment, reveals about non-native people's understanding of the world and our place in it and, and our values. In the process, I'm going to place um, the historical context that Celeste outlined alongside another US history. So first of all, I want to define settler colonialism for you borrowing scholar Gina Helio Whitaker's definition, and I'll also drop a link in the chat later, uh, and some of this language comes from her, her writing. 
You may be familiar with the form of colonialism rooted in European expansionism, in which European powers established colonies in places they supposedly discovered in order to extract resources and facilitate trade. The focus is on extraction rather than settlement. In contrast, settler colonialism, as its name suggests, does include settlement. But more than that, it is understood by scholars as an imposed structure rather than an event. This structure imposes relationships of domination and subjugation that become woven into society and are disguised as paternalistic benevolence. The objective of settler colonialism is always the acquisition of indigenous territories and resources, which means the indigenous inhabitants must be eliminated. This can be accomplished in overt ways, including biological warfare and military domination and settlement, but also in more subtle ways or perhaps subtle only to some, for example, through national policies of assimilation. Alongside US settler colonialism, specific ideas about nature developed, and these ideas later shaped and continue to shape US conservation. For example, what is known as the doctrine of discovery is a concept arising in the early 19th century from a series of US Supreme Court decisions through which European Christian governments laid claims to indigenous, non-European, non-Christian lands by arguing that colonizers had discovered these lands. Tied to this doctrine of discovery is the idea that this land was empty. You might be familiar with the term terra nullius, um, which you know, suggests empty lands. And also the myth of pre-contact nature as pristine and untouched. Both of these concepts are an example of the more subtle elimination of indigenous inhabitants. They use language and ideas to erase indigenous peoples. However, the supposedly untouched empty lands that are pristine have been actively managed by indigenous peoples since time immemorial. The early US conservation movement, which people date roughly from 1850 to 1920, relied on these ideas to establish, for example, national parks, which displaced indigenous peoples and dispossessed them of their lands. The related idea of wilderness constructs a place for white able-bodied men to prove their mettle, their rugged individualism, not a place where one lives and harvests food and medicines. These ideas of pristine and untouched nature still guide much of the ecological restoration happening in the US today, and they still reinforce settler colonial logics that erase indigenous peoples, their histories, and their knowledges. These Western colonial ideas of nature are rooted in relationships of domination and subjugation, whereby Euro-American peoples are the rightful possessors and the rightful arbiters of how best to utilize indigenous lands. Next slide, please. I want to turn now to talk about how this idea of invasiveness or invasivity relates to this discussion of settler colonialism and race. To do that, I want to talk a little bit about what I call the racial discourse of invasion. And when I use the word discourse, I just mean the set of language and cultural narratives on a specific topic that circulate through spoken and written language. Since early US settlements, white settlers have engaged the racial discourse of invasion to portray non-white others as invaders in order to maintain control over indigenous lands. White settlers positioned themselves as the native inhabitants in their claims that indigenous peoples were invading their own territories rather than defending them from colonizers. What is the effect of this? In addition to turning indigenous peoples into the invaders, it makes white control over the land seem natural. It positions white settlers as natives in a struggle against invaders, which in turn obscures white settlers' invasion of tribal lands, erasing colonial violence. Yet whites apply this discourse not only to tribal nations, but also to immigrants, most recently Mexican and Central American migrants and black migrants from the Caribbean and Africa. In this way, invasivity becomes a racial script, which is a term coined by historian Natalia Molina. A racial script is like a label that can be reapplied against various human groups that you want to construct as invasive on the basis of race. 
this idea of racialized invasivity is reinforced when we use the common names and militarized language that Celeste spoke about in her introduction to our topic today. This language closely echoes the racial discourse of invasion used against human groups considered invasive. And these invasivized groups are almost, if not always, considered not white. What I call invasive species discourse, again, that with discourse meaning the set of language and narratives that circulate when we talk in a certain way about these plants and animals, is part of this racial discourse of invasion. It echoes claims of invasivity used against Black, Indigenous, Black and Indigenous communities and other communities of color even those who have lived on this land since time immemorial. Better understanding this ecological thought and its historical roots is important because it holds up and reauthorizes settler colonial domination and subjugation, which has life or death implications. In terms of land management and ecological restoration, this language of invasivity, as I have said, echoes and reinforces problematic ideas about nature as pristine and untouched, which is used to frame racialized others as invaders. It justifies violent white norms of domination and subjugation in relation to both nature and other groups of people. Also, this language of invasivity limits the possible responses to the plants and animals who have been displaced here. That response is often limited to a militarized response of eradication. And we'll touch on that a little bit more when we talk about best practices and next steps. Um, I'm going to turn uh, this next section over to Celeste. Thank you, Lisa. So um, for this group in particular, I thought it would be interesting to go into a little bit of history of a, a couple plants uh, known in the Pacific Northwest um, and a, a little bit of history before that. So non-native plant species have been introduced purposefully or accidentally into the United States and Canada since European colonization with many used for food, fiber, or as ornamentals. And as early as 1672, European weeds were cataloged in New England following introduced plants and cattle. Uh, to this day, non-native plants continue to be sold in nurseries as ornamentals. So perceptions of non-native plants, such as purple loosestrife and Himalayan blackberry, have evolved over time. Um, this has impacted how they are treated, managed, and controlled. Environmental journalist Fred Pierce suggests purple loosestrife was most likely first introduced to the United States and Canada as early as 1829, both purposefully for horticulture and accidentally through European ship ballast deposits of rock and soil into dumps. And introductions also came via sheep imports arriving from Eurasia and Africa. Prior to the late 1980s, attitudes towards purple loosestrife were ambivalent, but from the 1990s on, it became one of the most studied and reviled celebrity, quote, exotic plant species in America. In a survey from 1982 to 2008, the top five words used to describe purple loosestrife in Canadian and American newspapers were invader, menace, pest, plague, and killer. Um, Himalayan blackberry um, also has an interesting history as a purposefully introduced plant. Um, it was brought to the Pacific Northwest by entrepreneur and amateur botanist Luther Burbank. Uh, through his brand, the Burbank, uh, the Burbank Seed Book, he traded and sold seeds around the world to create new breeds of plants for middle class America. Burbank imported blackberry seeds from India and named it the Himalaya giant due to its large and tasty berries. The plant was circulated throughout the country in 1884 and did particularly well in temperate regions along the Pacific coast, including Puget Sound. It became known as Himalayan blackberry by the early 1900s. 
Newspaper ads in Seattle from as early as 1905 show Himalayan blackberry canes offered for sale to the public by agricultural retailers and private parties. Luther Burbank wrote in 1915 of the plant's, quote, extraordinary vigor, a single cane may grow more than 25 feet, sometimes even 50 feet in a season, with a high production of 200 berries per plant. By World War II, the perception of Himalayan blackberry shifted. An article in 1944 by gardening columnist Cecil Solly indicated that civilian gardeners perceived blackberry as a nuisance when trying to grow other vegetables and fruit for the wartime effort. Luther Burbank was also a believer in eugenics. At the turn of the 19th century with rising immigrants, Burbank became interested in applying plant breeding principles to humans. In 1907, he wrote the book, The Training of the Human Plant. Here, Burbank wrote that the crossing, elimination, and refining of human strains would result in an ultimate product that should be the finest race ever known. So I would like to go a bit more, a bit into current context. Um, and this is based on a, a study I did on the Chinese mitten crowd, kind of um, you, you saw an excerpt of the play earlier. So I can, I will, uh, like I, I mentioned, I will drop the website link in the chat when I get a chance. But the website includes uh, the species origins from the Yellow Sea, the introduction through globalization via heavy ship traffic through ballast discharge, their natural history, behavior, global expansion, disease concerns, and conservation efforts. And the, from my language research, I found words personifying Chinese mitten crabs um, as intentionally causing harm. Uh, examples of words included infestation, pest, aggressive, steal, threaten, exploit, most formidable, and predator. Um, other phrases um, I found included a menace to the West, mittens, mini monster, send them home, and from the far East. I also found it interesting um, that the etymology of invasive and invasion um, in, include words attack, assault, assail, penetrate into, and enter violently. Uh, the historical context parallels the negative perceptions of animal species and pathogens from Asia with humans of Asian descent. And the goal of the play was to remove intentionality and blame from the species and onto human responsibility. I drew language parallels of these crab, quote, invaders with the propaganda against Chinese immigrants from the mid 1800s to the turn of the 20th century, as well as the rise of anti-Asian violence since COVID-19. Scary hornets from Asia. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this guy, the Asian, quote, murder hornet. Uh, negative perceptions of unwelcome insects parallel the recent and historical marginalization of human communities by dehumanizing them as pests, vermin, and insects to be eradicated. The apocalyptic sensationalism around Asian giant hornets as murder hornets not only led to fear and panic causing the killing of random insects, but it also demonized another species from Asia just at the beginning of COVID. I will now pass this back to Lisa. So we wanted to just note that the shifts in language use and naming that are underway at the moment. Um, one example would be the National Organization of Environmental Educators, which some of you may be familiar with called Just Language and Ecological Education. And these folks are environmental educators who um, were told by visitors to their parks that some of the language that they were using in their public talks and in their signage and in their interpretive displays 
was offensive to these visitors, some of whom were um, recent immigrants or the children of immigrants. Um, and so in response to that, they um, have been meeting and working toward shifting to a more mindful, just language um, in their outreach and education. And there's also a Just Language Northwest chapter. And so if anyone is interested in getting involved with that, um, we'll, we'll share some information about that in the chat too. Um, I know that King County Noxious Weeds uh, has been active in efforts to uh, update their signage and language that they're using um, in their outreach and education efforts. Um, in addition, professional societies are working to change common names. Um, some of you may have heard of the Entomological Society of America's Better Common Names Project. And according to their website, examples include, like examples of names they're trying to change um, include names that contain derogatory terms, names for invasive species with inappropriate geographic references, and names that inappropriately disregard what the insect might be called by native communities. So examples might be, um, or examples are, you might have seen these in the news, um, they're discontinuing the use of the name gypsy moth and gypsy ant, because those names include a derogatory term for the Romani people. Environmental organizations are also altering their usage as well as an environmental agency, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Asian, Asian Re Carp Regional Coordinating Committee are switching from the term Asian carp to invasive carp, which as I discussed, you know, isn't the ideal choice, but it's possibly a step in the right direction. Next slide, please. And then we also wanted to signal as current, you know, the current context, indigenous environmental studies research that has been happening for a long time and is ongoing. Nick Rio and others have conducted research in with indigenous communities to better understand their perspective on displaced plants and animals. And Nick Rio is a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Lake Superior Ojibwe. And he and his um, colleagues point out that indigenous nations research into this area is underreported in scholarly literature, but includes quote, communication and education initiatives, scientific research that tests new stewardship strategies, ecosystem restoration through indigenous knowledge and adaptation of cultural practices to account for changing conditions, which includes incorporating introduced species into indigenous food systems, unquote. Uh, Rayo and Ogden 2018, which is noted in this slide, outlines some examples of adapting cultural practices to account for changing conditions. Rather than blaming these plants and animals for their presence here, they recognize instead an invasive land ethic. They write, quote, we found that Anishinaabe tradition bearers are more concerned about an invasive land ethic than the threats of invasive species. Elements of this invasive land ethic include the imposition of Euro-American property ownership regimes, command and control forms of environmental management, and a worldview predicated on the separation of people from nature. Our interlocutors describe the ways this invasive land ethic manifests in non-Indigenous governmental and NGO approaches to invasive species management, unquote. So I encourage everyone to seek out and read Rio's work. He has several articles. Um, on this topic, as well as other uh, really great work. Now, my own research with nine Native nations in the Upper Great Lakes region, which is currently underway, will add to this literature. Um, and once it is approved by the Native nations, um, I'll share it beyond the tribes. Um, I'll be presenting on this research on December 3rd, so you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. I'll try to remember to share my handle. I'll be posting the talk date and time there if you're interested in learning more. Um, so we're gonna spend the last remaining time that we have uh, talking about take home messages from this talk and some best practices. And I'll hand it over to Celeste to begin that.
Thank you, Lisa. I was having a, an issue with my video mute button. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I would like to start off by talking about sensitivity uh, to communities and their histories. So to foster a renewed perspective beyond the white dominant world of conservation, it is vital to gather insights and perspectives of black indigenous and other persons of color or BIPOC and underrepresented minorities to create culturally inclusive language. This is especially important when language of invasive species parallels how human communities are referenced in the media, conservation organizations, and science academia. Uh, organizations that welcome BIPOC and, and uh, underrepresented communities, uh, pers community perspectives and input can build trust and future opportunities for partnerships leading to collaborative decision making. Conservation organizations are encouraged to develop culturally responsive pedagogies and practices that develop multicultural sensitivities. Um, and I'd also like to talk about building empathy uh, through the arts, as I've done through some of my play reading. Um, as I mentioned earlier, part of my own advocacy is to create alternative language when describing invasive species that is holistic, non-polarizing, culturally sensitive and inclusive. Um, it's about critically looking at the meaning and context of words and whether they harm, and harm or empower people. Um, true change will only happen when embracing our empathy, compassion, and, hum and humanity to create a safe space for each other of all backgrounds and in all settings. And within these spaces, open conversations can empower people to freely express themselves and feel seen and heard. So theater is an entertaining platform that can connect audiences to their emotions, allowing for more empathy and personal investment towards the topic being addressed, as well as creating a pathway for self-reflection and contemplation. I had written um, another play that I will, I will not show you the excerpt of, at this time, but I will include a link. Um, this was part of a collaborative um, event uh, that Lisa Fink was actually a part of as a panelist, um, but it was an inter it was interdisciplinary um, in, in nature. And we had a after after showing an excerpt of the play, we had this wonderful panel of people of all different backgrounds, all women, um, um, being able to talk about language um, and the play, uh, just like uh, Invasion of the uh, Chinese Mitten Crabs, was also with people of Asian descent. There we go. And Lisa, if you would like to continue. Thanks, Celeste. Um, so in terms of community engagement, um, Changing language use in everyday discussion and when communicating with the public is something that uh, we recommend and something that we hope that we'll get a chance to talk about uh, later in our time together here during this workshop. Um, and so, you know, what, what, what is this language? It's the language and the titles of events in how you motivate other volunteers, how you speak to the media in your signage and emails really, uh, you know, there's this comprehensive shift in, in everyday language use uh, and communicating with the public. Some alternatives to militarized language that we offer, and I'll try to remember to put these in the chat, um, particularly in um, alternatives to that, that term invasive, um, since it is a militarized term, are newcomer, novel, opportunistic, successful, highly adaptive, displaced, um, I took a brief look at the uh, forest steward field guide that um, Lynn and Lisa C shared with us, and um, you know, I was noticing the use of the word infestation, for example, um, and you know that for me often brings to mind insects or animals that cause disease and evoke disgust and disrespect, um, which again can limit responses. Um, for example, you know, really push us toward herbicide use. Um, for common naming and when we're developing alternatives 
to the word invasive or other militarized language. Um, we really believe that it's important to have conversations with members of the communities that are most impacted rather than just developing our own names you know in our our smaller groups it's really reaching out to you know asian american and pacific islander communities immigrant communities indigenous communities in your specific location to see what language works for them what's the indigenous name um, and you know we also want to note that it's best not to demand free labor from them. And I'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, inclusion in that way. Um, in terms of shifting the cultural framework, um, you know, that or we like to think about respect rather than control, that the focus is on respect um, for, uh, these plants and animals, as well as the people. Um, and likely most of us, if not all of us here today, have a deep respect for the natural world. So we already have a practice of respect to build on. Um, in terms of plant management specifically, uh, we want to highlight practicing critical ecological restoration which means applying a critical lens holistically to our management practices and recognizing that context matters. As I suggested earlier, biological metaphors such as invasion engender certain practices such as herbicide use, which may have negative impacts on community members who live, work, play, and pray in or near these natural areas. And, and then, you know, then that becomes an environmental justice issue. Uh, I put in the chat a link, or not a link, but a citation for an article by and researched by Kari Marie Norgard, who did environmental justice research on invasive plant management in Northern California, um, involving the US Forest Service and indigenous communities there, specifically the Karuk. And she found that, um, you know, indigenous communities perceived an embodied risk when herbicide was used because they rely on public forest lands for harvesting foods and medicines and also materials for cultural practices such as basket making. And so they're handling these materials, potentially putting these materials in their mouth, uh, mouths. So, you know, they had uh, a particular embodied risk in relation to herbicide use that those who were applying the herbicide who were not members of those communities not engaging in those practices did not have have the same level of risk so this is a situation you know one example of of how context matters and um and how it's important to um talk to a variety of you know the different communities who are uh living and working and um interacting with that space. Um, the other thing about um, practicing critical ecological restoration is, is really, is trying not to overlook other practices when focused on responding to what, you know, invasion. Um, so Nick Rio in particular writes about getting to know these plants and animals better and understanding how they might be utilized, not in a utilitarian way, but in a way based on relational responsibilities. And what is called invasive species management impacts indigenous lands, territories, and treaty protected resources. Therefore, it's very important to respect and promote the rights of indigenous peoples and nations that are affirmed in treaties and other agreements. Um, displaced species do impact treaty protected rights, such as harvesting. However, many settler management techniques in turn also impact those treaty rights. Um, members of native nations may be actively harvesting um, in those areas that are being treated. Uh, they also might be harvesting introduced plants that are being treated and removed. Um, and it's really important in, in trying to practice uh, this that we respect and promote um, native nations right to participate fully if they choose in restoration projects. Uh, that means developing ways and means of ensuring full participation if they choose on issues affecting them. Uh, full participation in restoration projects from conception and planning, not later or at the end, like look at what we did and this is okay, but from the very beginning, for example, deciding which plants to plant. 
um, it's important again, not to demand free labor of them if you're going to um, ask for consultation. Um, it's appropriate to compensate people for their time and their knowledge. Um, and then uh, drawing on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about what that full participation looks like. So that's fair, independent, impartial, open, and transparent. Um, that gives due recognition to indigenous peoples, laws, traditions, customs, and land tenure, land tenure systems that recognizes uh, their rights pertaining to their lands, territories, and resources, including those which were traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used. Um, and lastly, I wanna note that if you engage in this critical work, which we hope you will do, as in, you know, for those of us who are non-native people, we need to remember that not all knowledge is for us. Um, there is knowledge in the world that is not meant for you if you are not a member of a native community or a specific native community. Um, and those of us trained at Western institutions can often fail to recognize that. And it's something that we believe is really important to remember. Celeste, if you have any additional comments, uh, otherwise uh, I can hand things over to Michael. I have nothing to add at this time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Hey everyone. Well, thank you so much, Lisa and Celeste. I, uh, I learn so much from each of you each and every time I hear your voices. It's really incredible. I thank you for, um, yeah, the context for you know the the perspective that you feel from your um, from your personal lives as well as um, kind of that revisionist uh, kind of history that from that's kind of contrary to what a lot of us learned in in school. Um, so I would, um, yeah, invite you all to just feel free. I don't know if you caught um, Lynn's invitation to post questions in the chat. Um, I didn't see many. So actually there was, okay. There was one little question um, from, I think we're gonna maybe, I don't know if we're able to, post this real quickly, but um, post people are asking uh, about some alternative terms to the term to the word invasive. I don't know if uh, I don't know if anyone I don't know if Lisa or Celeste you have some comments on that, but um, kind of while you feel free to jump in, but while you're thinking about that, I just want to tell you that we are going to segue into breakout rooms pretty, pretty soon. So but I don't know if you just want to cut, if Lisa or Celeste, you want to cover that before we break out? I believe Lisa mentioned a few earlier. Yeah. Um, so she, I she just popped wants... them in the chat too. Yeah, yeah. As I said, I would, but I, I can say, you know, again, and, you know, this is something that we can talk more about in the breakout um, yeah. rooms too. I hope we will. Um, it's an ongoing conversation. These are just you know, potential ideas um, that I know people are actively using, actually, uh, these alternatives, newcomer, novel, opportunistic, successful, highly adaptive, displaced, mm -hmm. are just a few. And if you've heard some that you, you know, maybe you're using or um, uh, that just popped into your mind as maybe you've been listening, you know, we'd love to hear what those are if you are, feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has other ones. Um, and then I think I will let everyone know we were we are working on a um, with Jacob de Guzman. Um, him and I worked on uh, some alternative language in the new GSP crew work specifications. So you all will should I don't know if you all peruse that long document um, that we use for crew work and for GSP crew work, but that'll be coming out soon. Um, it is too, I think, uh, just the sh what I have learned, you know, the past few months, it's one thing to shift language, but however, our, um, this is one thing to unpack perhaps in the breakouts, but 
into the future is just like how we can shift language however our practices somehow um can be somewhat remain the same you know um and and can be somewhat disrespectful or yeah militaristic in our responses to these to these plants in our lives in our in our forests um, anyway, so I do want to move us along. It's five o'clock and we do have, there's how many of us? There's like, I guess, 30 some odd of us in, um, in the Zoom room still. And we're going to, if you all want to stick around, we do invite you to stick around. We're going to breakouts now. So, and there's um, all the staff that are here and Lisa and Celeste are going to um, help facilitate some discussion. And there's some questions that we're going to pose to you if everyone's ready. Yeah, I'll go ahead and open the rooms now.